Buenos días, California. Maligaña en sábado. ¿No? Maligaña en sábado. It is uh, really a privilege and an honor for us to be here in your midst. We praise God for that opportunity. And we do want to thank um, Pastor Salajan and his wife and family for the opportunity to be here and um, worship our loving God together. I want to uh, especially thank Pastor Joe because it's, it's, uh, um, being a pastor also, I know it's not easy to share uh, your pulpit with anyone. And just, I just feel privileged to be standing at this pulpit this morning. So I just want you, Pastor Joe, to know that. And um, I want to invite you, friends, to read uh, together the text found in John chapter 1 as we enter into, enter into what we will be discussing and, and talking about this morning. So please, please, open your Bibles in the Gospel of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I think we will also have the text on the screen. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. All right, so, so you follow me, please, as I read these verses to you here. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. This morning, dear friends, I want to share with you um, the importance of connecting with God and how to do it. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, our Lord, our God. We want to thank you for the opportunity to now come to this moment when we hear about you, when we think about you, when we experience, we experience your presence in our lives. So, Father, for that, we want to pray that you may, you may give us, um, please, ears to hear, a mind to know, and grant us, please, Father, a heart to believe. Lord, please, we want to know, we want to connect with Jesus this morning. And that's why we pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Connect with God. Let me just turn this on. Oh, wow. Oh, man. I forgot to charge my tablet, and I have my outline in my, on my tablet. Oh, man. Did, did anyone bring the power, the power cable of the fridge? Did anyone here? Fridge, power cable. Or, or, or maybe, maybe somebody brought, brought um, that, that cable that you use to, to connect your iron machine to the wall. Did anyone here? Anyone here? No, no, wait, 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 wait. I see, I see people moving. Wait, 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 wait. Have you noticed that cable will work? You really, some people start looking around and see this, this is, this is a, a tablet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all this. But do you notice that, that a cable, a cable is actually 100%, Pastor Tanya, 100% charged. Thank you very much. So efficient, Pastor Joe. You have the best people here in your church. As soon as I, I, as soon as I went red, I... I I think they saw it, they started acting. Wow, wow, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Notice, not any cable works with the tablet. There are, there are cables, there are cables that are specifically recognized by the tab tablet to be connected and receive power from. Do you notice that, friends? So I, I, this, is, this is great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this just proves what I wanted to illustrate this morning, friends. AV engineers, again, man, you're, you're the best. I, I really didn't want to give you an extra stress on your day. Sorry. 
But again, I did, I did all this only to, share, to say that there is no way we can connect to God without recognizing God. In the same way that the tablet needs this special cable that will be only recognized by, by the tablet, in the same way we need to connect with God, and to connect with God we need to recognize God. In other words, dear church, without knowing God, there is no way to connect to God. I want to suggest this morning, dear friends, that the one thing necessary for us to connect with God is that we come to know, we come to know God, which is, which is what you, you stand for as a church. We need to know God so that we can recognize God. Wasn't it Jesus who said, who said that we would hear his voice and we would recognize that voice and we would follow him because we know, we know him. But here is a question, friends. How, how, how do we know God? How, how can we really know God? Thank you for asking that question, whoever asked that question. So, some people will suggest prayer. Some other people will suggest nature, heaven, etc. I want to humble submit uh, Laguna Niguel Church. I want to humble submit to you that one of the best ways to know God is through the Bible. It's through the Bible. Now, now we all understand and all, all agree that this is the Word of God. It's called the Word of God because we believe here is where we can meet the author of the book. How many of you agree with me? Can I see your hands? But when we come to this book... These are 66 books full of, full of information. And, and, and when you come to the book as a first-timer, the first question that should come to your mind is, where do I start? Where do I start re reading, young people? Right. There, 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 was, there was, I like that answer, though. There, there was one dilemma that I, I faced in my beginnings when I wanted to, to connect with God through His Word. Where do I start reading this book? Did anyone have that same experience in your beginnings? I mean, I mean, for a person who comes to the book, for the first time, the amount of pages, and this is a small version of the Bible, but you can see this, there are some big, big Bibles as well, but the amount of pages and particular information can simply be overwhelming. Don't you think? Where do I start? Where, where do I start reading? Can I just, like some people do, here? And they go, there are, do you know that there are some people that just open the Bible randomly and they said, this is the will of God for me today? There are people that read the Bible like that. And so, friends, where, do, do I just open the Bible whenever I want and go and read and we, I will connect with God? That's one way. That's one way. But, friends, in my beginnings, when I had that dilemma, there was somebody, I don't remember who it was, but there was somebody who told me to start in the Gospel of John. So I went to the Gospel of John. Church, John connected me to our God in a way that I never ever thought possible before. Yes, the Gospel of John showed me God and I fell in love with the God of John. Today when a person comes, comes to me with the, the same predicament, uh, guess where I recommend them to go first? To, to the Gospel of John. Let John connect you with his God. And so, dear friends, dear friends, um, for the first, for, for the next few minutes, and, and Pastor Joe already gave me the, the, the green card to continue as long as I want this morning. And I don't know if you back up your pastor, but I hope you do. We have all the time, he said, we will have lunch after, so people should stay here as long as we need to stay. Is that, is that everyone's agreement here? So for the next minutes, I am just kidding, by the way, I, I don't like to be too long here. I, I want to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us about this beautiful gospel. My mission here, dear friends, is to discover how we connect with God. The mission that Pastor Joe gave me this morning, by the way, is to, is to learn how we connect with God. And my humble submission to you, friends, is that there is no other book in the whole Bible that will do better that job than the gospel of John. Why? Are we to go back to it again and again to connect and reconnect with God? This is why we are going to study this today. So let's begin. Let's begin. Let me tell you, dear friends, let me start this off by saying that the Gospel of John was written around A.D. 95 to 100. 
And this research is, a, is an important piece of information because based on this, we can conclude that chronologically speaking, this gospel is the last book of the Bible. Not the book of Revelation, but the gospel of John. This gospel was written then for the second generation of believers. Those who didn't see the Lord firsthand. Those, those who were not eye, eyewitnesses. In other words, in other words, when the faith of the new generation was going cold, God inspired John to write a powerful reminder of the validity and veracity of the story told about the Messiah. Here's a suggestion for all of us who want to connect with God. Here's a suggestion for you and for me. When your own fire starts going down, starts to go down, go back to the Gospel of John and know the God of John anew. Fall in love with the God of John afresh. Connect with God all over again through the Gospel of John. So, this is the last Gospel of the four Gospels, right? But let me ask you this question, dear friends. If you already have three complete Gospels, why do you need a fourth for? Right? You already had Matthew, Mark, Luke, complete. They already gave all the information that was necessary for us to know the Savior. What do you need? Why do you need a fourth Gospel? I want to suggest to you, friends, that the answer to the, this question could be answered this way. Number one, the gospel's concentration it has to do with what the, the writers of the gospel's focus was. The gospel concentration. Listen to me, friends. The, book, the gospel of Matthew focused essentially on what Jesus said. The Gospel of Matthew talks about those sayings of Jesus, talks about um, uh, well, the, the, uh, the Beatitudes, talks about the Sermon on the Mount, talks, talks about Jesus saying, you have heard, but I said. So, so the Gospel of Matthew takes time to, to, to record all that Jesus said. The concentration of the Gospel of Matthew, therefore, is what Jesus said. Now, the, book of, uh, the Gospel of Mark has a different concentration. Mark is the shortest of all the Gospels. And what Mark does is to concentrate on what Jesus did. So the Gospel of Matthew, what Jesus said. The Gospel of Mark, what Jesus did. And then we have the third Gospel. The Gospel of Luke, written by Dr. Luke. The Gospel of Luke now concentrates on what Jesus felt. So it records all those emotions that Jesus had. The Gospel of Luke. But if you notice... We're still missing something very important, and that's why we needed the Gospel of John. That's why the Holy Spirit inspired John, the apostle, to write this fourth Gospel. And the fourth Gospel, the concentration of the fourth Gospel is to, is to know, is to let us know that Jesus, who Jesus was. Who Jesus was. If you think about the Bible as the uh, century in the Old Testament, think about the, the uh, Gospels. As the holy place of that century. And if you consider the Gospels as the holy place, consider also the, you can consider also the um, Gospel of John as the most holy place. That's why some scholars will consider the Gospel of John as a spiritual gospel. In other words, the remaining three Gospels are about the earthly um, life of Jesus, the, the earthly event of Jesus. And they say that the Gospel of John is more spiritual. The heavenly recordings of Jesus is more spiritual. Now, notice this, friends. Notice this. I'm, I'm, I think the Holy Spirit has been orchestrating all these so that when these writers put together these books, he had, the Holy Spirit had in mind something very interesting for our lives today. Very practical, friends. The Gospel of Matthew records what Jesus said. That is mental. The Gospel of Mark records what Jesus did, that is what everyone, physical. The Gospel of Luke records what Jesus felt, and what, what do you think that is? Emotional. What were we missing out of the four dimensions of a person? We have mental, physical, emotional. There was one component missing, and a spiritual. And then the Gospel of John was written. The Gospel of John is, is known as the spiritual gospel because it closes that, that ring. It closes that, 
that those events that that um, cover every dimension of a person physical emotional emotional mental spiritual that's one reason the the concentration of the gospels that's why the gospel the fourth gospel was written but there is another reason also that is suggested here friends why do we need another gospel the gospel of john is not written in a chronological way per se it is written following the jewish festivals now the jewish festivals are those feasts that were around the century and these are then the feasts around the what we know as the century the tabernacle now check this out dear church when the century was set up in the desert the 12 tribes were to be arranged around this rectangle right all 12 um, tribes were to be arranged here in groups of three right and so we have um, all these three tribes around the century under one banner. This is important, friends, because there was one tribe that was in front of each one of those tribes, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Ephraim, and the tribe of Dan. What is interesting about these, and it has a relation with the Gospels, is that those banners are in this order also. Lion, man, ox and eagle this is what the, the scholars say about these things the tradition actually says about this these four uh, banners these four lion the lion the man the ox the eagle are are actually different faces of the messiah so what you would say the gospels are four different faces of the same god mental physical emotional we were missing one the Gospel of John closes the ring of the, of the three synoptic ones with a masterpiece on the divine nature of Jesus. This is, this is the concentration of, of John. John wants to show you, John wants to show me that Jesus was not only a good teacher, a good, a good preacher, a good healer. He was the son of God. And so the Gospel of John is special also because John shares information that is not found on the other gospels that's the so-called synoptic listen friends 90 percent of john is unique of this gospel 90 percent now what is the purpose of all this all this exclusive information why the exclusive information 90 percent the gospel of john is written with one purpose and is revealed in the very same gospel in john chapter 20 the verses uh 30 and 31 states uh john states there what the purpose of the gospel is and this is what the bible says listen to me friends and truly jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book john says and then verse 31 in reference of this those signs john says but these are written that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and that believing you may have life in his name why did John write this book? Because G John wanted you to know this God so that you may desire, you may long to connect with him. If you don't know anything about him, if you don't know who he is, if you are not sure about Jesus being the son of God, why would you want to connect with him? So for John, it's essential that you and I will come to understand, will come to know, will come to experience this God so that we may want to fill the need of connecting to him. Now, the process of life in the Gospel of John is very specific and is the following. This, this is how you obtain life according to John. Number one, you hear the message, the Gospel after you have heard you know the gospel finally after knowing you believe the gospel and as a result of hearing knowing and believing you receive life you will see this across all the 21 chapters of the gospel you hear the gospel of the gospel of john you hear the gospel you give the gospel you know the gospel you believe the gospel and and finally you receive life so hear know believe life these words are very special for John, and John has a, a way to use words in his gospel. For example, the word to know, the verb to know. John is only second in the whole 66 books of the Bible in the use of this word. 
He uses it 61 times to know. To know. And again, the only way to connect with Jesus, you need to know Jesus. And this is what John is an expert of. of. He is uh, only second to Ezekiel. And of course, Ezekiel is a bigger, is more than double in length than the Gospel of John. But now, if you add the Gospel of John plus three his letters and also the book of Revelation, you have many more uses of that word to know than any other writer in the Bible. Then the next word is the word believe, to believe. Now, the word to believe is used by John more than any other book in the Bible. 109 times. No one, no other writer uses so much this word to believe. So you can conclude just for the uses of these words that John is after showing you or giving you access to know this God. And also that he considers that it's very important to come to believe in this God. And finally, the word life, which is the result of hearing about this God, knowing this God, and believing in this God, you finally receive as a result of this life. Life. Now, friends... This word, the, the, the word life, the writer mentions, John mentions this word more than any other writer. More than 50 times altogether. Now, in the Greek, there are three different words, at least three different words that describe the word life, that are used, that are translated from the word, uh, translated into life. One word simply describes the physical, biological life. Another word describes the inner life. And finally, the word that John uses is the word zoe in the Greek. And zoe is not inner life. It's not physical life. It's not uh, biolo biological life. It's actually quality of life from God. This is the word that, you, that John uses every time that he describes life. Connect with God, friends. This is what John is saying. Connect with the God of John and receive, receive Zoe, the quality of life. But he is, is not promising this. He's not telling us that we are receiving, we are to receive this through the connection with God in eternity. This is not something that we can receive. This kind of life is not something that we will receive tomorrow. It's a life that we can receive, a quality of life that we can receive here and now. This is the benefit of connecting, one of the greatest benefits of connecting with God. God wants to give you this quality of life here and now. Now, all this information, John writes it with one purpose. That you believe in the Son of God. That is the conclusion of the matter. That you believe in the Son of God. This is, this is a, a matter of death and life. That you believe in the Son of God. Because the only way for us to connect with Jesus is that we will know who he is. We will know him. And so for that, John has to prove to you, has to prove to me that Jesus is the son of God. God himself. That's the greatest point of all. When somebody doubts about the, the divinity of Jesus, all that we have to do is go send that person to the gospel of John. So John writes 21 chapters to demonstrate that, that very fact to each one of us. So think about this, friends. Every divine claim, every divine miracle, every divine encounter, every divine title, every paragraph in the Gospel of John is inspired to show the reader that Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the God of John. Connect, dear church, connect with the God of John because in doing so, you will have all the benefit, benefits of connecting with this God. Friends, the gospel of, uh, of John was written by the disciples whom Jesus loved. John, son of Zebedee. You know, you remember Zebedee. You remember why this was introduced like, John was introduced like that. John was a brother of James. And they together, John and James, they, will, they receive a nickname from Jesus. And that was the sons of thunder. The son, that doesn't sound any, that doesn't sound friendly at all. The sons of thunder. It, it doesn't sound appealing to me at all. Dear friends, 
these sons of thunder became actually the, the beloved disciple. It's mentioned that way in the very gospel. Or the disciple of love. And here is hope for you and for me, church. Here is hope for all of us. I can be whichever type of negative person. But if I connect with Jesus, he can receive my toxic personality and give me a brand new character based on his love and mercy. Connect with the God of John. And, and so, and so, the church, John became the apostle of love. After Paul, in more, of course, Paul has more books, or wrote more books than, than John in the Bible. There is no other author in the whole Bible that speaks more about love than John. Fifty times the word is mentioned in his book. Fifty times. He is, dear friends, a transformed person who wants you, who wants me to connect with the one that transformed him. But wait. You? Why are we talking about you and I here? Was the gospel written for me? The question here will be, who, whom, to whom did God, John, write this gospel? That's a fair question that we need to deal with, friends, because the gospel of Matthew was written for the Jews. The gospel of Mark was written for the Romans. The gospel of Luke was written for the Greeks. How about the gospel of John? That's a fair, fair, quest, fair question. Now, all of us know the most famous verse in the, in, the, in the Gospel of John. That most likely will be the most familiar verse in the whole Bible. And that is John 3.16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he, he gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Based on John 3.16, which is the most familiar verse in the whole Bible, we can say that the gospel, we can conclude that the gospel of John was written not for the Greeks, not for the Jews, not for the Romans, but for the world. And that, my dear friends, includes you. That, my dear friends, includes me. Now we should understand with all this introduction, we should understand why John starts his gospel by saying what we read in the beginning. This is why he wants you to, to know Jesus. This is why he wrote the gospel of John when there was there was there were other three gospels to say this and this is how John starts his gospel his all his 21 chapter he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made now, do you hear that repetition of one word? It was the word. John describes, starts his gospel by talking about the word. Now, why is it that John didn't say directly Jesus? Because we know in verse 14, the Bible says, John says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that the word in reference in the first verses of the gospel of John is actually Jesus. Why? John didn't say directly Jesus, and instead he used the word, the, the words, the word. Why? Why not just saying Jesus? Well, we, I want to suggest, these friends, that he wanted to awake. This is the main reason. He wanted to awake in the reader the curiosity to know who he was talking about. Because remember, John wants you to know this God. John wants you to know this God so that you can connect with this God. Why do you need con connection with this God? Because if you are unplugged, if you are disconnected, you will simply die. So, so he wanted to make, to, he wanted to awaken in, in us uh, the, the question, who, who is he talking about? Who is this, the word that John is talking about? So as we know, as we saw, uh, um, as we know this in the gospel, we know that back then when this was written, um, the, the, the world was highly, um, heavily influenced by, the, by Greek philosophy. So he used what they knew to teach them about his God. The word for Greek, for the Greek, logos, was a powerful divine principle of order. In creation powerful 
but not person, non-personal. John, dear friends, is masterly giving a new meaning to such a powerful name. The Logos became flesh and dwell among us. Other passages, other readers, excuse me, were the Jews. So for the Greeks, the Logos. For the Jews now, for them, the word was the Menra. Menra. The, the Menra that they were so much reverenced, that they, they so much reverenced and appreciated according to the Targum, which was, which was a, an old um, Hebrew document. Now, the, the word Omenra was considered by, by them as a manifestation of divine power. So for the Greeks, the Logos, for the Jews, which will be the readers of this gospel, the Memra. Now, John tells them this manifestation. This is what John is saying by saying the word here. This manifestation, the Memra, is here in the flesh. So think about these people reading this, this gospel and getting into, into um, um, digesting what they were reading. Think about how they, their world was rocked by what they were reading. So for the, for the, to the Greeks, the Logos was here. To the Jews, the men rise here. And to the rest of the world, God is with us. John He's showing us who in the 21 chapters of the Gospel of John. He's showing us who God is so that we may come to know Him. And only by knowing this God, I can be inspired. I can, be, I can desire to, to connect with this God. And so John starts his Gospel. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Now, church, church of Laguna Niguel. Do you notice how John is preparing the road for for? What he is going to do, be doing for 21 chapters. Do you, do you notice why he started this? He, he says in the beginning. And that should bring our minds to what happened in the beginning. Or what happens in the beginning of our book. In Genesis. So John, just like Moses, doesn't take time to explain what the beginning is. Or like Moses, he didn't take, he didn't take time to say... Um, uh, God is this or is that. They go just straight to say, in the beginning, in the beginning was Jesus. Just like Moses. See, dear friends, this first chapter is preparing us to know the God of John. John is writing about his God because he wants you, he wants me to get to know this God. What is the urgency, John? Why do you want us so much to get to know this God? Now, can you, see, can you see this? This master way, a masterly way to start the gospel. If not, I'm here to help you. John here says that Jesus is, according to these three verses, John says that Jesus is pre-existent, co-existent, and self-existent. Where do you get that? Some of you might be asking. Well, let's go again to those three verses and let me help you see what the text is saying here in this about the pre-existence of God, the coexistence of Jesus, the coexistence of Jesus, and finally the self-existence of Jesus. In verse 1, clearly says, in the beginning was Jesus. And in case you were not sure about what he was writing in verse 1, John repeats that in verse 2 by saying, Jesus was in the beginning. So John is saying from the beginning, Jesus pre-existed. So anyone that said that Jesus was created has to face what John starts uh, by saying in this, in this, his gospel. So Jesus is pre-existent. But if Jesus is not only pre-existent, he's not only pre-existent, he also is coexistent with God. And that's what John says in verse 1, in Jesus was with God. So Jesus is coexistent with God. In verse 2, he says, Jesus was in the beginning with God. So Jesus, uh, John from the beginning is saying, is stating, he is 
assuring to all the readers that when you come to know this God, the God of John, you're actually knowing that God who is pre-existent, co-existent. But there is one more that he is describing here in these verses. And that is that Jesus is self-existent. And this is the greatest of all the existences of Jesus I want to propose. Because this is the one that sets Jesus apart. Not, not only as somebody that was created, but the creator himself. Self-existent. This is what the verse says. In the beginning was Jesus. End of the thought. John doesn't give you more information. He simply says, in the beginning was Jesus. And then he says, and Jesus was God. End of the thought. Jesus is self-existent. Jesus is self-existent because he is the creator of everything. He concludes his thought. He is the creator of everything. What is that a big deal? He says in verse 3, all things were, were made through Jesus. And without Jesus, nothing that was made was made. Now, this very fact that Jesus is creator brings us to a reasoning that, that we have to work with here. To be creator, dear church, dear, dear church, to be creator, Jesus needs to be outside time and space to be able to create everything. If he is submitted to time and space, he will not be able to create everything. So he has to be outside of that. He has to be external. He has not to be surrendered to space and time. Now, to create everything, right? Now, to create everything, Jesus needed to exist also before everything. Follow me, please. Follow me. To create everything, Jesus needed to exist before everything. In other words, if Jesus were created, as some people may suggest, before everything else, then he did not create everything. Somebody else created everything because that someone created Jesus. Are you with me, friends? Now, if you are not sure about this self-existence part that John is describing here, if you're not too sure about this last one, his self-existence, don't panic. Because that's what the whole gospel is about. We are simply being prepared to receive all the evidence for the God of John. Know the God of John so you can connect with the God of John. This is John's invitation, dear friends. And it's just the beginning. He's showing all this so that you will want to continue reading his gospel. Why? Because as more, the more you read the gospel, the more you internalize that gospel in you, you are ready to get to experience the God. The gospel of John is about the God of John. The gospel of John is, is about Jesus, as you saw. Jesus, dear friends, is the gospel of John. And I want to conclude, dear, dear, dear church, I want to conclude simply summarizing what the 20 chapters are all about. And I want you to be focused here so that you can see what is it that John is writing and why he's writing in all 21 chapters. So listen to me, friends. 21 chapters written about Jesus. In chapter 1, Jesus is the Word. In chapter 2, Jesus is the divine provider. In chapter 3, Jesus is the Son of God. In chapter 4, Jesus is the Savior of the world. In chapter 5, Jesus is the divine healer. In chapter 6, Jesus is the divine bread. In chapter 7, Jesus is the divine teacher. In chapter 8, Jesus is the great I am. In chapter 9, Jesus is the light of the world. In chapter 10, Jesus is the good shepherd. In chapter 11, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. In chapter 12, Jesus is the king of Israel. In chapter 13, Jesus is the humble master. In chapter 14, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, Jesus is the true vine. In chapter 16, Jesus is the sender of the helper. In chapter 17, Jesus is the divine intercessor. In chapter 18, Jesus is the divine substitute. In chapter 19, Jesus is the crucified king. In chapter 20, Jesus is the resurrected king. In chapter 21, the last chapter, in chapter 21, Jesus is the divine resurrector. Jesus is the God of John. Connect 
with the God of John. Dear friends, I just want to conclude right here. Because I want to send you home or send you to lunch thinking about the Gospel of John. And this afternoon, we will talk about a more practical stuff. How, what do we do with this now? Once I get to know this God, once I get to experience this God, once I get reconnected or connected with this God, what do I do with this experience? See, friends, there is a big difference between this tablet or an electronic device and us. We can connect for a moment and be the rest of the day just fine. Some of us think we just do this, there's just one moment, and once the battery is up, I'm good. See you, God. See you next day. On the contrary, we need to be connected with God all the time to live. So let's stop thinking we operate like these devices. And, and let's connect instead permanently to the God of John. Now, friends, do you want to fall in love again with the God of John? Do you want to connect in a unique way with the God of John? Then I give you the gospel of John. Study it. Spend time with this book. Let this book take over your life. Allow the writer, allow, allow the author of the book to show you why he fell in love with this God. Because by in doing so, you will experience the God of John. Now that you know God, now that you know who God is, then, dear friends, you and I will be ready to connect with our God. Friends, this might be the first time that you heard so much information. I'm sorry, but I needed to share that information with you this morning. It might be that there was some information that was just way too much. I didn't need to hear that. But all that we attempt to do this morning, friends, is that you will know, you will know there is a God that inspired a writer so much so that he wanted you to know the character that he's writing about. So here is the invitation. Here is the invitation, dear church. The invitation is, the challenge for you and for me, is that we will dedicate time to know this God. Because the more you know God, the more you will fall in love with this God. And you know what? Love is the greatest power in the universe. For love, we do crazy things. For love, we go around the world to be with the person we love. That's the love that God wants you to experience. Because once you get to know this God, once you get to connect with this God, you will want to do something with what you have experienced. About that, this afternoon at 2.30. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to praise you for thinking about us, for inspiring John to write his gospel so that we may know you. Father, you don't don't just want us to know as an information in our brains. You want us to experience as a transformation in our lives. And today, Father, I want to bring this. Your children, people that I never met in my life, people that I don't know, but the same people that you have tracked and walked with every single second of their lives. We have come to this moment. We have come to this moment when we have to make decisions, Father. And in the same way that you have, you, you have led all our steps till today, we believe that you will continue leading us to, till the end. Father, today I pray for that person that might be struggling with believing in you. I want to pray for that person that perhaps believed in you and went away and just now is trying to come and reconnect. Father, you not only want to connect with us, you also want to reconnect with us. And for that, Father, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, will come and minister to those who want to reconnect and those who want to connect for the first time. 
Father, this is the essence of discipleship. And today, we just pray, Lord, that that fire of seeking you may, be, may have been ignited this morning. Father, please bless us and fill us with your spirit. We pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everyone say,